In this video lecture, we'll be looking at non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, a really important class of drugs that I'm sure many of you have taken before. There are many different types of NSAIDs that can be classified according to their structure. I've just listed some of the more important ones here. For the salicylates, we have aspirin being the primary example. For acetic acid, we have diclofenac and indomethacin being the primary examples. And for propionic acid, we have ibuprofen. Now, the way that NSAIDs work is by inhibiting an enzyme called cyclooxygenase. There are two subtypes of cyclooxygenase, COX-1 and COX-2. And therefore, we can classify NSAIDs as either being COX nonspecific and therefore inhibiting both these enzymes, or COX-2 specific, only inhibiting this COX-2 enzyme. Let's look at this diagram down here. Membrane phospholipids are broken down into arachidonic acid by an enzyme called phospholipase A2. Arachidonic acid can then be converted into leukotrienes by an enzyme called lipooxygenase or into prostaglandins and thromboxane A2 by an enzyme COX. NSAIDs work by inhibiting COX and therefore decreasing the synthesis of prostaglandins and thromboxane A2. In a previous lecture, when I talked about corticosteroids and their effects, they actually acted all the way up here on phospholipase A2, inhibiting it and therefore leading to a reduction in these two down here, but also a reduction in leukotrienes. When we also spoke about corticosteroids, I also mentioned that they work by inhibiting COX-2, which is an inducible enzyme that we will revisit later in this lecture. COX-1 is a constitutive enzyme that has important physiological roles, particularly in the GIT and renal tract. COX-2 is an inducible enzyme that is induced by pro-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-1, interleukin-8, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and others. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about toxicity that can arise due to decreased levels of prostaglandins as well as uh, thromboxanes. One really important one to remember is gastromucosal damage, which can lead to ulcers and blood loss. This is due to a decreased level in the gastroprotective prostaglandins. By having low levels of these prostaglandins, we can get reduced mucus and bicarbonate secretion, as well as increased acid secretion and mucosal ischemia. In order to counteract this, we could administer acid secretion inhibitors such as proton pump inhibitors and histamine 2 receptor antagonists, or we can administer prostaglandin analogs such as misoprostol, which can replace the lost prostaglandins within the GI tract. Another toxic effect that can arise is bleeding, to in bleeding due to inhibition of platelet function. Thromboxane is essential for platelet function. Next, we can get limitation of renal blood flow, which can lead to water and salt retention. Prostaglandins are really important for promoting blood flow into the kidneys. We can also get delay and prolongation of labor, as well as asthma and allergic reactions. Next, we're going to look at the actions of NSAIDs. NSAIDs can act as analgesics due to the reason that they decrease prostaglandins. And it is important to note that prostaglandins themselves do not decrease pain, but potentiate the pain-producing effects of other inflammatory mediators such as serotonin or bradykinin. NSAIDs are also pretty good anti-inflammatory drugs. An important thing to remember is that their anti-inflammatory potency is proportional to their ability to inhibit COX. Therefore, if we have a drug that can inhibit COX very potently, we will also expect it to be a potent anti-inflammatory drug. As mentioned before, they can be antithrombotic and antipyretic or anti-fever. If you remember the last time you were sick, you would probably also recall the fact that you just always found you were cold. If you were laying down in bed, you needed an extra sheet. If you were in the house, you needed an extra uh, jacket. And the reason is, during an infection, we get production of pyrogens such as interleukin, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interferons, etc. And these induce prostaglandin synthesis in the hypothalamus and change the temperature set point in the body. And if we change the temperature set point in the body to a higher temperature set point, 
we will therefore start to feel cold and the need to increase our body temperature through behavioral changes such as putting on an extra layer or covering up more. It is important to note, however, though, that when taking NSAIDs and because of their anti-fever effects, someone may think that, oh, you know, I'll decrease my temperature to below normal. No, that doesn't occur. Their antipyretic effects are only taking your temperature down if you had a higher temperature. And also NSAIDs are thought to potentially have anti-cancer effects. And also they're found to close the ductus arteriosus. So if we have a premature baby who, who uh, was delivered at uh, 28 weeks or 30 weeks and they had a patent ductus arteriosus, a clinician could administer indomethacin which will close it. Now, there are many precautions and contraindications for NSAIDs. If people have peptic ulcers, as I mentioned before, by taking an NSAID, you're going to increase gastromucosal damage. Therefore, if a person has a history of it, you're not going to put them on it. Also, if people have chronic liver disease, since a lot of NSAIDs are metabolized in the liver, it's not a good idea to put them on it. Pre-surgery, it's important to stop NSAIDs at least seven days before the reason being is they can act as blood thinners and when you're in an operation, the last thing you want is your blood not to be able to coagulate. During pregnancy, it may cause premature closure of the ductus arteriosus in low birth weight. Therefore, it is not advised to give it to pregnant women. Instead, if you give a drug such as ibuprofen, uh, or sorry, not ibuprofen, such as paracetamol, which is a weak COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitor, it is much safer. And also, it is not advised to administer it to breastfeeding women. Now we're just going to spend a couple of minutes on paracetamol, also known as acetaminophen in the United States. It is a weak inhibitor of COX-1 and COX-2, therefore it has very weak anti-inflammatory effects. If you remember what I said before, the anti-inflammatory effect of these kinds of drugs are directly proportional to the potency in which they inhibit the COX enzyme. Paracetamol acts as an analgesic, antipyretic, but lacks the GI effects. It is metabolized in the liver and is hepatotoxic in high doses and has a half-life of 2 to 4 hours. In the final part of this lecture, we're just going to talk a little bit about COX-2 inhibitors. COX-2 inhibitors make a lot of sense, right? COX-1 is a constitutive enzyme that is always active and COX-2 is an inducible enzyme that is induced during times of inflammation, therefore it makes sense to inhibit it. And also another really key factor is that these COX-2 inhibitors have fewer GIT side effects, better tolerability, and also longer duration of, uh, of action. It has a half-life of 11 to 13 hours. So what's the catch? The catch is if you've ever heard about Rocoxvib or Vioxx, you would have known that it was withdrawn in 2004 due to its association with cardiovascular incidents. Drugs used these days such as Siloxivib have large warning labels on it not to be administered to people with family history or past history of cardiovascular diseases.